By whose authority? By whose authority is one of the most critical questions that we can ask in our day, but it seems that most people don't bother asking that question. It needs not only to be asked, but I hope to show you this morning from the Word of God that it is our duty and our obligation as Christians to be asking this question rooted in a biblical Christian worldview in every area of life. By whose authority? Well, I had an interesting experience this week in a conversation with a college president that shall remain nameless, but it happened to be a publicly funded college, so our tax dollars are paying salaries and paying facilities and all that sort of stuff. So it's appropriate that those who run that institution be held accountable to the people who actually pay the bills. And the question was, why they have made it an obligation for every student that they must fulfill what they call a diversity requirement, a course they must take that will, in my terms, indoctrinate that student in the mantra of diversity. Now, we've spoken about the whole issue of diversity from the pulpit here before, and so we won't enter into that. But historically, we know the fact of what diversity really is about. It's about an agenda of a plan of cultural change in America. It's cultural Marxism, the path to a Marxist revolution that is slower. It's a march through all the institutions rather than a violent uh, overthrow such as the Russian Revolution of 1917. So rather than a bloody revolution, a revolution that nonetheless will entirely change our culture and our country. And we know in particular this diversity agenda is a pro-abortion agenda, let's murder the babies, and a pro-sodomite agenda with a design, specific design of destroying God's holy institution of marriage and family, the way God designed marriage and family uh, to work. And that is a foundational purpose of Marxism. They want to destroy families altogether, that there would be no families when it accomplishes what it intends. Now, in this conversation with the college president, they were very nice, they listened, and they countered every single attempt uh, that we were putting forward. They countered that, and they claimed that they had this commitment to diversity, and they would up be upholding diversity. But that's kind of curious. Wouldn't diversity mean that every student in the college got to choose what they wanted to study? And so if they didn't want to take a course in diversity, wouldn't it be diversity to allow them not to be forced to take such a course? Oh, curious, but no, that thinking didn't seem to enter into. But a revealing statement was made about the purpose of the college. And they said the college was there and existed to create an engaged and inclusive society. Wow, I thought colleges were about educating and training people, you know. No, it's about creating an engaged and inclusive society. So they're freely admitting that college is not about education. It's about transforming society, creating one that by their definition would be inclusive and by their definition would contain diversity. They want to change our society from what it has been. And, uh, you know, but they're revealing their hand in doing this because they're saying they don't like the way America has been for 300 years. They don't like the way the Western civilization has been for two millennia. And historically, we know what that, is, that means. America has been and was founded as a Christian nation. Western civilization for nearly two millennia has been specifically Christian. Therefore, what they want to accomplish is jettisoning a Christian civilization for something they call inclusive, something they say is uh, full of diversity. And in doing that, uh, they are becoming polytheists. That is, they're saying there are many gods that need to be worshipped and followed. There are many truth claims in the world rather than Christianity and monotheism, they are becoming polytheists. And all of this really is a code word for relativism, the claim that there is no absolute truth, that all truth claims need to be treated equally. 
when you break this down, in the minds of college students, who, by the way, are at a very vulnerable time in their life intellectually as they're uh, putting things together in their thinking, you break it down in the minds of these college students by indoctrinating them in this mantra of diversity. And if there's one particularly recalcitrant student that won't go along with that, they'll give them a pejorative name like bigot or homophobe or whatever they choose, pejorative names, and they will use the power of peer pressure on that student because all the other students are going along with the agenda, the power of peer pressure to break them down, to bring that student into conformity. You see, it's not really about diversity at all. They will tell you this, you can believe whatever you want except believing there's absolute truth. That's the only thing that is unacceptable, except believing that the Bible uh, is true and everything it says is true about every area of life. You see, what they are really about is a type of persecution that the early church faced. You see, it was fine if you lived in the first century to worship all kinds of gods. It didn't matter how many or what gods you choose, provided, provided you didn't claim that there was one true God, and his worship alone was all that was permissible. That was unacceptable in the Roman world. And so Christians were persecuted because they believed there is only one God, rather than the polytheism of our, their day. I said our day, and that's increasingly what it's becoming. Because what they are advocating is an aggressively anti-Christian society, a society seeking to indoctrinate college, college students to this specific end that they will reject absolute belief system at all. They will reject Christianity. Now as questions were asked and positions were revealed, and the one question I valued the most was this question I began with. By whose authority? By whose authority has the college, college there established their goal of creating a more inclusive society, promoting uh, diversity? By what authority were they imposing this diversity requirement upon their students? Did they go to the people who are paying the bills and survey all of the taxpayers in this jurisdiction and determine that the majority of those taxpayers wanted and demanded that the college adapt this goal of diversity? Or they're a public institution, so did they go to their elected representatives and ask of their elected representatives to determine a new direction, a new goal for that institution? Or did they simply sit down on their own and determine for themselves this was the goal of college? Well, to answer to that question kept coming back to two supposed higher authorities which the college claimed that it had to adhere to, that it had to answer to. One was the Middle States Commission on Higher Education, which oversees the accreditation for all nonprofit higher education institutions in the Middle Atlantic region, and supposedly it requires diversity. And the other was a thing called the Maryland State Plan for Higher Education. And so I did a little searching and looked on the web at the website of the Middle States Commission on Higher Education. How is it established? By whose authority was it established? Their own website declared this. The commission is a voluntary, non-government membership association. In other words, there's no authority here at all. They voluntarily, the colleges voluntarily put themselves under this middle states accrediting thing. And so you'd say, well, why would anybody do that? So in further of their defense on their website, website it says the Middle States Commission on Higher Education is recognized by the U.S. Secretary of Education to conduct accreditation. Wow. So they're claiming the U.S. Department of Education grants them or recognizes that they are an authority on the issue of accreditation. And where does the U.S. Department of Education receive its authority? Supposedly, you would say, in the U.S. Constitution. But you can read the U.S. Constitution all day long, and I hope you would at some point. And you'll discover there's no authority anywhere in the U.S. Constitution by which we, the people, have granted to our federal government to do anything about the subject matter of education, not to determine any standards, not to spend any pennies. We, the people, have not granted authority for the federal government to do anything in that regard. There was a day in America where most people knew that. In fact, Ronald Reagan ran for office with a promise to end that Department of Education, which, sad to say, did not happen. 
And so the Department of Education has no authority to do anything at all, let alone determine who can accredit, uh, be the accreditation standard for colleges in America. And so we didn't get that far in this conversation with the college president as they, time ran out and they had to go on to another meeting. But the point needs to be made across our country. Academic standards that are promoting anti-Christian animus are being installed both in the lower level of education and in higher education by institutions that have no legal authority whatsoever based upon a false premise that the U.S. Department of Education is a lawful organization and is actually legitimate. By whose authority? Not only in the issue of education, but in every area of life, this is a vitally important question. We are daily confronted by those who will command our obedience to certain things in life, and they will try to twist our thinking and violate God's word, claiming they have the authority, and when we poke at it, we often discover their authority is a self-asserted authority, like the U.S. Department of Education, like the accrediting organization, like the college. They have determined that they are the authority, and their mantra is to persuade us that they are the authority so that we will obey them. But as Christians, this is not to be for us. Turn in your Bibles to Titus chapter 3 and verse 1, because as Christians, we need to look at the authority question from the Word of God, ask the question in every area of life, by whose authority? We need to understand that question and the answer to that question, but also as Christians, we need to understand and determine what is a legitimate authority, and then secondly, how are we to interact with those who are and do represent actual legitimate authorities? Look at uh, Titus chapter 3 and verse 1. Paul here commands his disciple Titus, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. And so what Paul is saying here to Titus, he's saying remind them of something they've already been taught. This is not a brand new thought to them. Uh, the Apostle Paul, it, it would appear that when he was on the island of Crete and evangelizing that island, that he taught them these basic principles. And so he's saying, Titus, put them in mind, remind them of what ha we have already uh, taught them. Now, historians in the first of the first century tell us that uh, Crete was notoriously an unruly place. It would seem the people that lived on the island of Crete had a bent towards rebelliousness, rebelliousness against any form of authority. Perhaps they were like the people of today who claim to be anarchists. I don't know if you've ever encountered an anarchist, but they say all civil government is bad, therefore there should be no civil government. We know that's obviously not a biblical understanding as God has ordained civil government and given it limits as to what it can and should do. That's the biblical understanding. Uh, but the boundaries, what we find in God's Word, the boundaries of civil government and what it's permitted to do do not include education. Education is not given to the civil government at all. It is instead given to the family government according to God's law, which is the supreme law of the universe. And so, by the way, it would mean that it didn't matter, actually, if our U.S. Constitution actually granted the civil government power to do something about education. For them to do so would be violating God's law and therefore disobedient to the supreme authority of the universe, God himself. And so Paul here commands Titus to put them in remembrance of what he had already taught them regarding submission and obedience to authority. And so we need to ask the question, by whose authority? As we did with the uh, college president, we need to ask, by whose authority? Where does the, the authority question lead us? Is there an ultimate source of authority? Is there ultimate fountainhead, a primary source? Yes, there is. If you have your Bible, turn to uh, Matthew chapter 28. In Matthew chapter 28, we have Jesus' last words before he ascended uh, to heaven. And we find that uh, Jesus had given his disciples instructions during the period between his resurrection and his ascension. By the way, we are in the, those days in the church calendar just leading up to Ascension Day, which is this Thursday. May 25th is the day in the church calendar when we remember that Jesus ascended to heaven and is now seated at the Father's right hand. But before he ascended, notice what he taught his disciples. He taught them many things, but what he taught about the question of authority. 
who is the source of all authority on earth. Look at verse 18 of Matthew 28. And Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, All power, by the way, that word power can also be translated authority. It's the Greek word exousia. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in a moment. But all authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Now, most Christians have no problem with the first part of that. That Jesus, of course, he has all authority in heaven. That's where his throne is. That's where he rules. All the angels obey. Jesus has all authority in heaven. But we stumble often, don't we, when we come to the thought that Jesus has all authority on earth. Because doesn't that mean that, therefore, there can be no human authority here on earth except it is a derived authority, an authority that is delegated to some human being by the Lord Jesus Christ himself? And wouldn't this mean that all holders to human authority are actually holding a grant of authority from the Lord Jesus Christ, and therefore they are ultimately accountable to the Lord Jesus Christ, and he could withdraw that grant of authority from them at any time they seek to violate his powers or the grant of authority that he has given to them. Any time the delegate would overstep the bounds that God has established and violate the commands of God and the law of God, then the authority that Jesus Christ has delegated to them is removed. They are no longer the authority that they claim to be. Wouldn't this mean, therefore, that presidents and kings and even dictators, they only have derived authority? And should they ever overstep God's ordained boundaries for them, should they ever act in violation of uh, God's law and ever act in a way that is not in submission to God's law, word, they lose that position of authority that they claim gives them authority to command other human beings regarding anything in their life. You see, if all authority in earth is under the Lord Jesus Christ, it means all authority. There's nothing left out of that equation. So, Paul is speaking to Titus in 3.1 and telling him, command them, remind them to be in submission to all authorities and to all powers. Let's look at the two words that, that Paul uses translated in the King James as principalities and powers. They're the Greek word arche and the Greek word exousia. Let me tell you about the Greek word arche. It means the beginning. When John in his gospel says, in the beginning, God, that word arche is a translated beginning. It's the very first thing that's done. And because it's the first, it also contains this idea that among a, 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 cr a community of human beings, some are first. They're the principality. They're the leader. They're the ruler. They're the one in authority. And so when it's used in this context, as it is here in, in chapter 3 of Titus, chapter 3 and verse 1, it's the idea of the person who is first in that community, the one who is the ruler, the one who is uh, in charge. And so quite frequently this is used not only of human beings, but it's used of angelic creatures. Turn, if you would, to Colossians in the New Testament. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 10. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 10. And it says, Ye are complete in him, that is in Christ, which is the head of all principality, there's the word arche, all principality and power. There's the word exousia or authority. So Jesus Christ is the head of all rulers who have any authority on earth. He is the head of all principality and all power. So he's the boss. He's the ruler. He's the one who has all uh, principality and all authority. It's Jesus Christ. And look at verse 15 there in Colossians chapter 2. Verse 15 states that because of his death, he has done something to those who claim to have power and authority before his death on the cross. Look at uh, 2.15, Colossians 2.15. And having spoiled principalities, there's that word arche, and powers, there's the word exousia, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them. Very interesting. 
So by his death on the cross, Jesus Christ spoiled all those principalities, all those rulers, and all those authorities who claim to have power and authority on this earth. Jesus triumphed over them. In essence, he defeated every one of them. Now, of course, we know this is a reference primarily to the demonic forces, the demonic forces in the world that claim to have power. Jesus defeated them decisively at the cross. It's interesting to see that Jesus uses the same word arche when he refers to human civil government. And he says this, let me read to you from Luke 12 and verse 11, referring to human authorities. He says, and when they bring you into the synagogues and unto magistrates, here's that same word arche again, civil magistrates, human civil magistrates. He goes on to say, take no thought what you're going to say. So he's speaking here and prophesying that there will be persecution of Christians by those who are in positions as civil magistrates, as civil rulers. Why should that be? Jesus is foretelling us that human civil governments will find the gospel of Jesus Christ offensive to them in their power, and they will persecute those who proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ because they will find the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ a threat to their power base. That's kind of astonishing because most people think, oh, you know, Christianity has to do with your, you know, your religious belief system and, and your life that you might, what you do in the four walls of your church and what you might do at your home. It has nothing to do in the marketplace, right? It's nothing to do with the business of the civil government. It has no impact there, but that's false. These world powers, Jesus says, they're going to recognize that the gospel of Jesus Christ is absolutely revolutionary and changes not just a person's personal own life, it changes their family life, it changes their church life, and it will change civil government. And civil government is threatened by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Those who proclaim the gospel present a threat to the powers that be, and they react as tyrants always do when they perceive a threat to themselves and to their power. They either turn to violence or they threaten violence to those who will not fully submit to them and do as they command. So the first term that Paul uses, arche, is principalities or magistrates. The second term he uses, exousia, is often translated powers, but it is also translated properly authorities. So Christ is saying that he has all authority. That doesn't leave any authority for anyone else. If they claim authority, it must be authority that's in submission to the authority of Jesus Christ. Consider Christ's relationship to the authorities. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 20. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 20. Here it speaks of which he, referring to God the Father, which he wrought in Christ when he, God the Father, raised him from the dead and set him, that is, set Jesus Christ, at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality, there's the RK, and power, there's the word exousia, and might, and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And so Jesus Christ is far above these principalities. He's far above these authorities. And God the Father, by raising Jesus Christ from the dead and seating him at his right hand, is far above all of these supposed authorities and powers upon earth. Jesus is above them all because he is greater than them all. In fact, Jesus Christ is the very source of all authority. Any human authority is ultimately answerable to the Lord Jesus Christ. When we look at those two words, principalities and powers, or authority, or, or magistrates and authorities, we find in Scripture that when Paul's telling his, his, uh, uh, the island of Crete, the believers there, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers to obey magistrates, Paul is speaking about duly constituted authority which receives its authorization from the Lord Jesus Christ. These powers have been defeated by Christ on the cross and by his resurrection. They are now in submission to him. They are below Christ. They must bow to him. They must serve him. It's interesting to see how clearly the early church understood this. 
and reacted based upon this teaching. We find the very first major conflict between human civil government and the gospel of Jesus Christ in the very early chapters in the book of Acts. If you have Acts 5, turn to Acts 5 for a moment. As I shared with the children, the apostles were preaching in the temple, and the authorities in the temple were not happy with them at all. They arrested them, put them in prison. The angel let Peter out of prison. What did Peter do? He went right back to where he was preaching before. He was told not to preach. He was put in prison. He began preaching the next day. And so they rearrested him and arrested all the apostles, dragged him into court, and uh, threatened them. And they answered in Acts chapter 5, verse 29. Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Obey God rather than men. Because these men claim to be authorities, but they're in rebellion against the true authority, the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, they did not obey the commands of authorities, quote-unquote, who said to disobey what Jesus Christ clearly said. This reminds us of exactly what Paul was saying then in Titus 3.1 that uh, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers to obey magistrates, that obedience to magistrates is only valid if it's obedience to what Christ commands us to do. So it is clear in God's Word that wherever a conflict arises between the commands of men and the law word of God, obedience is due to the word of God and not to the commandment of men. We don't go out of our way to look for such conflicts, but should such conflicts come, we need to know who is the ultimate authority. We need to know the answer to that question, by whose authority. And any mere man who contradicts Christ's authority has denied their own commission from Christ. They only have authority by Christ. They deny their own commission from Christ to exercise authority on his behalf. It would be like this if you kind of think of an analogy. You get tired of cutting your grass, and so you decide, decide to hire a lawn service to come in and cut your grass on a weekly basis or what have you, and you sign a contract. There's an agreement between you and uh, the lawn service that they're going to uh, take jurisdiction over uh, taking care of your yard work and, and maintaining that. And uh, you gave them no permission outside of that agreement to do anything with your house. But you come home one day, and not just the, the lawn's cut, but that lawn cutter got busy and he painted your house chartreuse. For some reason, they thought that was a nice color. And you're horrified. It's like, what? I never gave any agreement in the contract. I have been damaged by this. I'm going to fire this guy. He no longer has the, even authority to cut my grass, but I'm going to take him to court for damages he did to my house. I don't like the color chartreuse, so I don't want that. And you, the court would take the document, the contract, and they would take the evidence and look at it all and determine if indeed a violation has been done here. And clearly, you did not grant authority to that man who's going to cut your grass to paint your house. And so when he paints your house, there are penalties that are involved in violating the terms of that contract. You see, what most office holders in America and even around the world do not recognize is that Jesus Christ is their true boss, that he is the one who has granted them specific limited, uh, specific, limited, delegated, enumerated powers, only those powers that he has granted to them, and that when they violate the terms of the contract with Jesus, Jesus will and rightly can hold them accountable. It's interesting to see just three verses down where this same word obey is used again. Look at Acts 5 and verse 32. Acts 5, 32. And by the way, this is Peter preaching to these rulers. And he said, and we are his witnesses of these things, and so also is the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. The obedience is due to God. And if a claimed command violates what God has commanded, we are not to obey any such command. Those that obey God, to them God has given His Holy Spirit, which makes a pretty bold statement to these people who are arrayed against the apostles. He's saying to them, you don't have God's Holy Spirit. You are walking in rebellion and disobedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
You see, magistrates and civil rulers of all kind are obliged to obey Jesus Christ as their supreme ruler, as the source of all authority on earth as well as all authority in heaven. When they don't obey him, then they lose the grant of authority. Humans are not obligated to obey them. For to obey them in their rebellion against God is to join in that rebellion and to become an enemy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now we see plenty of that rebellion today. And it appears from our perspective oftentimes that wicked rulers are getting away with that rebellion. In many cases, such as here in America, they're literally getting away with murder. Tens of millions of babies murdered. The people whose only crime was the place of their residence, their mother's womb. But that rebellion and that wickedness will not last. Turn, if you would, to First Chronicles. Corinthians, excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where we are given a very clear image of what's going to happen to those so-called rulers, so-called authority. Here's the future of all human authorities, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 24. Then cometh the end. He's given a long train of events that are going to take place. Then cometh the end when he, that is Jesus Christ, shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. And there's those two Greek words again, arche and exousia. All rule and all authority and all power on earth is going to be put down. So we see people rebelling against the Lord Jesus Christ today and seemingly getting away with it. It's not for long until they will be put down. Every principality, every authority, every power on, on earth will be brought to nothing and they will be forced to be in submission to Jesus Christ as King of kings and as Lord of lords. And so when Paul commands, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, then he adds a final clause, to be ready to every good work. And that should remind us in this final phrase that this is the last nail in this teaching. To be ready to every good work is our command from the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, for example, if we're commanded to do an evil work by a so-called authority, we must not comply. We must not obey them. For example, think of a German citizen back in the 40s. And the German citizen commanded by the Nazi high command to murder Christians, to murder Jews, and to murder gypsies. That German citizen was under no obligation by Jesus Christ, the ultimate authority giver, to do anything of the kind. The Nazi, by issuing such an order, indicated that he was not an authority at all. He had never been given, he had never been given power to do what he was doing. He'd been given specific, limited, delegated, enumerated powers to do certain things, but never to command a citizen to murder another human being. Any mere man who contradicts Christ's authority has denied their own commission from the Lord Jesus Christ to exercise authority on Christ's behalf. They are in that moment no magistrate. They have unkinged themselves. They are no legitimate authority at all. Consider here in America. So we look at Nazis, oh yeah, it's very clear. But how about in America where hospitals have been, and I understand still are, commanding nurses to participate in the murder of babies, that is, babies still in their mother's wombs. And against the objections of these nurses, they're being told, we're going to fire you if you will not participate in this murder. They have no authority to command such obedience. For to obey these evil people is to disobey the Lord Jesus Christ who commanded, thou shalt not murder. You see, when we understand what the Word of God teaches, then we're introduced to a whole new perspective in this life and how we are to interact with human authorities, always asking the question, by whose authority? And we could look at many examples in scriptures of great saints of the past who asked that question and answered it correctly by putting themselves under the authority of Jesus Christ. For example, you have read in Exodus 1 about the Hebrew midwives told to murder all the baby boys that were born. They would not obey that. They obeyed God. We're told about Moses' parents told to murder the baby Moses. When he was born, they would not obey that wicked order. Moses himself and his life, all of his interactions with Pharaoh, he did not obey what Pharaoh commanded. 
And when we look at uh, Scripture, we find time and time again, the saints of old were led to this position where they had to ask that question, by whose authority? And they ultimately had to answer by saying, by the Lord Jesus Christ, we will obey Him. If you have your Bible, turn to Daniel chapter 1 because I just want to illustrate two ways in which we may interact with those in authority when they issue a command that is against God's law. Daniel chapter 1, you recall Daniel and uh, his friends as well as thousands of other uh, Jewish boys were taken captive by Babylon to their kingdom, taken out of, out of uh, Israel to, to the kingdom and were being trained to be in the administration of the government of the nation of Babylon. But Daniel, look at what he did, it is starting in verse 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. So Daniel was saying, I know what God's law says regarding dietary laws that was com competent upon the people of Israel. I'm not going to violate those laws even though the king here is commanding me to do so. Therefore he requested, it says, of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who hath appointed your meat and your drink, for why should he see your faces worse, liking, the liking that of the children of Israel of your sort? Then shall you make me endanger my head to the king. Then said Daniel to Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days. And let them give us pulse, that is, vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our countenances be looked upon before thee and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat. And as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So he consented to them in the matter, in this matter, and proved them ten days. And the end of the ten days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. See, Daniel was confronted with a command by a superior, the king here, to do something that he knew was in violation of God's law. And Daniel reasoned with his immediate supervisor. He reasoned with him and he appealed to him not to force him to violate God's law, not to force him onto the king's dietary regimen. And notice Daniel listened to his superior, to the chief, to understand the dilemma that the chief was faced with here, that uh, if these... Uh, these four, Daniel and his three friends, if each of them looked worse, then the king would threaten the life of the chief. And so Daniel, understanding the situation, having listened to the authority and, and reasoned with the authority, Daniel took that understanding and he proposed an alternative to the edict of the king. Now, this alternative would require some compromise on the, on the part of the civil magistrate in this, in this matter. But the compromise was designed by Daniel not to endanger this chief before the king. And so we see here the wisdom of God that enabled Daniel to, to work in a way where he could appeal to the authority and look for an avenue of, of appeal that would, be, uh, re would resolve with Daniel not having to disobey God's law. And God granted that. And so there are times when we are confronted by human civil matters or human civil government that commands us to disobey God where we, we may be able to appeal to them and by that appeal and reasoning with them come to a solution whereby we can walk in obedience to God's law. But not every situation presents itself that way. Turn over to uh, two chapters, to Daniel chapter 3. What happens when appeal is not possible? And here we have Daniel's three friends by the way, these three friends are spoken of in Scripture, Daniel and his three friends. These four, we know that there were thousands of Jewish young men that were taken captive to Babylon, and we hear nothing of them at all. They disappear from the pages of history. Why? Because they did not obey God's commands. They didn't issue a, a request, as Daniel did, to not eat of the king's delicacies. And they did not, in this case, stand up against the idolatry. Notice what takes place. Uh, this is verse, uh, verse 8 of Daniel 3. Wherefore at that time certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. They spake and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree in every, that every man shall hear, when he hears the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, uh, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, 
he should be cast into the fiery furnace, in the midst of the burning fiery furnace. There are many Jews, there, no, he said, there are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee, nor serve, they serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do ye not serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now, if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, harp, sack, but psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye shall fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Clearly here, they were not given any alternative. It's bow down and worship that they couldn't come up with an appeal to say, well, maybe rather than worshiping that idol, we're, we'll worship this idol. No, they couldn't do that because they knew the first commandment, no other gods. And the second commandment, don't make any images, don't bow down to any images. They could not in any way, shape, or form have an appeal to what the king was commanded here. There was no alternative available. And therefore, notice their answer. In verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. In other words, they said, King, you have lost our respect. Sorry, we're not going to be careful in our answer to you. We're not going to placate you. We're not going to uh, uh, kowtow to you in any way, shape, or form. We're going to answer you straight up and notice what they say. If it be... So, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. Notice what the king had just said. No God is able to deliver you. And they said, uh-uh, king, you got it wrong. We worship and serve the one true God, and he is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. Now, there's a bold statement right in the king's face. Well, you say, well, how, that, how would that work out? Because if they got thrown into the fiery furnace and they die, oh... If they die, they are delivered from the king. They're no longer subject to the king. They're in the true king's presence, in the presence of God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit in heaven. If they die, it's a victory. So they recognize that even if they die, it's going to be a victory. And God will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. A bold response to King Nebuchadnezzar. Let it continue. But if not, that is if we die, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. It was a direct rebuke to the king. And by the way, you read the rest of the account, the king got extremely angry. He fired up the thing seven times hotter, and he was just infuriated. And then we know the rest of the, the account of what God did in that. But the point I want to make is these men were willing, willing to pay the ultimate price to remain faithful to God's command when a human civil authority commanded them to do opposite of what God clearly commanded them to do. Today there are millions of martyrs around the world for Jesus Christ. People who have paid that ultimate price just as these three Hebrews were willing to pay that price. And we know that the persecution of Christians around the world is ramping up. It is increasing dramatically. Many, many are willing to pay that ultimate price of loyalty above all else to the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, this is the history of the entire church. From the Acts chapter 5 persecution to Acts 7 when the first martyr, Stephen, was martyred for his faith. Again and again, Christians have stood against wicked human civil governments that commanded they disobey God's law and they were willing to pay the ultimate price. Imagine a warm spring afternoon in the city of Ephesus, close to the end of the first century. The great city's main avenue, Corso, paved with white marble and lined with the busts of the emperors of Rome, filled with a great throng moving toward the arena where the games were to be held. Soon the great bowl with its tiers of stone bleachers reaching toward the heaven, filled with a vast multitude of hungry people, blood, hungry for the bloody shows that took place in the arena. Here and there there was clouds of incense going up to cancel out the disagreeable smell of blood and death. Under the purple canopy sits the Roman governor and his staff, one side of the show, as it's put on, there's the boxers and the javelin throwers and those who fight with swords and, and so on. But when the arena is cleared, the shout goes up from the crowd. 
the Christians, throw the Christians to the lions. And this is the chief spectacle, spectacle everyone's come to see, the climax of those shows. The pleasure-loving multitude has been waiting for this moment. As the thousands are shouting, a door is opened under the last tier of seats. A small company of men, women, and children are led out to the center of the arena. One is an old man, not too far from the grave, by nature's path, even if he had not been condemned to death in the arena. Another is a, a handsome young man, strong and muscled, to whom life must have seemed dear. Another young woman in the bloom of beauty and youth. Another mother with a little child in her arms. Gathered close together, their eyes sweep the stone bleachers above them, looking in vain for a face that would show sympathy, a face that would desire their deliverance. And while the mob cries for their blood, they kneel together in the sand. The old man lifts his hands in prayer. And when the prayer is finished, they rise up from their knees, standing close together, and they begin to sing. They begin to sing the psalm of 2 Timothy 2. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. And the gate on the farther side of the arena is pushed open, and the lions who have been starved for weeks rush out into the arena. Behold the helpless Christians, and with fierce roars they leap upon them and tear them to pieces, limb from limb. Only a few bloody relics are left. But those who love not their lives to the death have won the martyr's crown. And it was not just the first century that many Christians went to martyrdom. Consider the 15th century under the guard of a thousand armed men followed by a vast throng of people. John Huss, some who say he was the one who lit the first fire for the Reformation. John Huss was escorted to the place of execution, what's called the devil's place, a meadow near the lake. He walked to the stake and as he did, he recited Psalm 51 and then Psalm 31. In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Into thy hand I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. His arms were fastened behind his back. His neck was secured to the stake with a chain. And the straw and the wood were heaped up about his neck. And rosin was sprinkled over the entirety of it. He was offered one last chance to recant. And he said, I shall die with joy in the faith of the gospel which I have preached. Then the torch was applied. And as the flames leaped up, Huss repeated the prayer of the liturgy, O Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy upon us. O Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy upon me. Thou who wast born of the Virgin Mary. And at that moment the wind caught the flames and blew them into his face. And his voice was stilled forever. But like him who first died for Christ, Stephen, being full of the Holy Ghost, he looked up steadfastly into heaven, saw the glory of God, Jesus standing on the right hand of God, and he won the martyr's crown. We live in increasingly perilous times, and we must decide now if Christ Jesus is truly our Lord and Master, and that we will commit to obey no command contrary to him, contrary to his perfect law word given to us. The time may come. And certainly, if the trajectory of what's taking place in America today does not change, the time will come when to truly follow Jesus Christ, to obey His commands will be against the so-called law of the land in America. Human authorities, when they command us to disobey our Lord, are no longer authorities. But we know the Word of God clearly commands us that all authority comes from the Lord Jesus Christ is delegated to humans so long as they abide within the boundaries of God's commands, so long as they do so. But should they step outside their very limited grant of power, then it is our duty to either appeal to them if that is possible, and when it is not, it is our duty to resist them and resist them even to death. Let's pray.